I'm Dan Reddy. I hold the Schreier Chair here at CSIS, and um, thank you all for coming. We're hosting an exit interview uh, in honor of uh, Ken Wallach's uh, service as CEO of the National Democratic Institute. I'm really pleased that um, two people I really admire, I consider heroes, and are really wonderful people in, in addition to that. Uh, Secretary Albright and Ken Wallach are here, um, and so it's, uh, it's a really an honor to have them both. Um, Secretary Albright, who I'm going to ask to come up and make some remarks, uh, of course, was a, a Secretary of State under President Clinton, but has also been in a very important champion uh, for democracy uh, in, the, in the world, and has also been an important voice and uh, has led, has been the chair of the National Democratic Institute. I learned today that she had some historic ties to CSIS. You had a, in a, in a past life, you were involved with CSIS. I'm thrilled you're here, thank you. And I think one of the things I admire most about Secretary Albright is her partnership uh, across the aisle ac throughout her career, whether it was playing Columbia, and she has a brooch today that's from Columbia that was given to her by the Colombian government in recognition of, of her being one of the architects of Plan Columbia. Uh, her work with my friend Vin Weber, uh, just the, one of the words I think of when I think about Secretary Albright is bipartisanship and working across the aisle for, for values that we all believe in. And so I'm so pleased you're here. I'm going to ask you, Secretary Albright, to make some remarks and then we'll continue with the program. Please come on up. Please welcome Secretary Albright. Thank you very much, Dan, and it's wonderful to be here. I did have an association with CSIS when it was in uh, smaller quarters. Uh, uh, and I uh, did research for Dr. Brzezinski, and he said my title was Empress of Research. So uh, <clears throat> I really am very grateful to CSIS for organizing uh, this uh, event and for inviting me to participate, because uh, even if I'm just a warm-up act, for Ken. Uh, but let me just say this is um, I do have to tell this story, and it is a sign of bipartisanship. <clears throat> and that is that um, one, one of the things that happened uh, at the beginning of the Bush administration, he, uh, there was a meeting called of former people to come <clears throat> and uh, be uh, really briefed on what was going on in Iraq. And <clears throat> so we're sitting in the Roosevelt Room, and one of the weirder parts that I think some of you have had this experience is to go back to buildings where you were when they were in different hands. And so <clears throat> it's always interesting to go back to the White House. And so uh, President Bush came in and he talked an awful lot about the importance of supporting democracy and um, various things that we had to do. And then we had a briefing on everything in Iraq. And then as the thing was over, he said to me, uh, well, why don't you come in and let me show you how I've redecorated the Oval Office. And so we're walking through and I said, Mr. President, I so agree with the fact <clears throat> that you uh, are telling us to support democracy, but you act as though you invented democracy when actually I did. Uh, <clears throat> but what I should have said actually Ken did. So, and he really did. And so in all seriousness, uh, I'm very pleased to be here, uh, to be here, both to show my appreciation to Ken and for his decades of leadership of the National Democratic Institute, and to offer my own perspective on the topic of democracy support, a perspective shaped by my experience as NDI's founding vice chair and now the chair. President Kennedy once said that, and I quote, democracy is never a final achievement, it's a call to an untiring effort. I don't know if JFK had Ken in mind when he said that, but I can think of no one uh, who has responded to democracy's call with greater or more untiring effort. Consider that when Ken joined uh, NDI in 1986, it was a bustling enterprise of six full-time staff with a part-time bookkeeper who stored records in shopping bags. Uh, Ken took a chance um, on NDI, especially since the previous year Congress had cut all funding for the Institute and its Republican counterpart, IRI, taking away their only means of financial support. So during those early days, everyone worked on every project. NDI went into a country, conducted the program, and then left the country. And then it moved on to another country and conducted the program and then left the country. It was really amazing what six people could do. 
NDI occupied just a few rooms on Massachusetts Avenue, a, a few hundred feet from here, with two ancient computers. Times have changed, and today the sun never sets on NDI, with 50-plus field offices and 1,000 staff spanning the globe, representing nearly 100 nationalities. But most importantly, Ken's personal and professional values have never changed. His rock-solid integrity is unmatched, and his passion for democracy has never wavered. Although it's hard to believe now, at some of the first meetings, the Board of Directors vigorously debated several key items, including, and this is really hard to believe, whether NDI should conduct any programs overseas, and whether NDI should be involved in observing elections. Those debates were clearly resolved, but there were certain principles established and expanded upon during those early days that still define NDI. We work with small d Democrats in every region of the world to build political and civic organizations to safeguard elections and to promote citizen participation, openness, and accountability in government. We have embraced a multinational approach and have resisted trying to impose democracy, which is actually an oxymoron, and have always drawn the line uh, against trading our values for any program. Through more than three decades of expansive growth, as well as seismic political change worldwide, NDI has remained true to our core principles, and that's in large measure because of Ken's willingness to make the hard decisions and to choose the right way over the expedient way. In a few minutes, we'll have the opportunity to hear Ken reflect on his career spent supporting democracy. Uh, what I thought I'd do is to help frame that discussion, is to talk about democracy in the context of U.S. foreign policy. Because our wisest leaders, Democrats and Republicans alike, have always understood that American foreign policy must be shaped not solely on the basis of what we are against, but also what we are for. And our interests dictate that we should be for a world in which democracy is defended and universal values upheld. Of course, the question is whether democracy is worth supporting, um, and that has never been an academic question for me. Uh, and you all know, because I was born in Czechoslovakia, where actually 70 years ago this week, a democratic government was overthrown by a communist coup. And the coup forced my own family into exile, and a few months later, uh, we made our way to the United States, where we were welcomed as refugees and given the priceless opportunity to begin our lives again in freedom. The impact of the coup also reverberated globally hastening the passage of the Marshall Plan, the birth of NATO, and reorienting U.S. policy around the defense of democracy and the containment of communism. The decades that follow provide uh, an ample proof of the wisdom of supporting democracy. In the 1950s and 1960s, democracy helped Germany and Japan become integrated into the world economy and evolve into key allies of the United States. In the 1980s, the promise of freedom inspired solidarity um, and the Velvet Revolution and other movements that lifted the Iron Curtain and ended Cold War security threats. The democratic gains that followed uh, in the 1990s inspired the enlargement of NATO and opened the door to the expansion of the European Union. In this hemisphere, the spread of democracy allowed the United States to work with our neighbors more closely than ever uh, to broaden prosperity, address social ills, and expand the rule of law. The growth and consolidation of democracy also enabled countries in the Asia-Pacific region, including Indonesia and India and South Korea, to become economic and strategic partners for the United States, and democracy helped bring about improvements in development, health, and security across the African continent. When the Cold War ended, uh, many felt that democracy had passed its biggest test and was marching on the right side of history. But I have to say that in the years since, the sense of euphoria has dissipated. The financial crisis and growing gaps between rich and poor have fueled anger and deepened doubts about the capacity of democracy to deliver on its promises. 
The war in Iraq, which uh, brought neither stability nor liberty to the Middle East, gave the promotion of freedom a bad name. Technology, which was once thought of as a democratizing force, interestingly enough, has proven to be a double-edged sword. Social media has disaggregated voices and made governing much more difficult. Um, and in recent years, it has been co-opted by freedom's foes who are now adept at polluting social media platforms with rumors and disinformation and authoritarian propaganda. And all this has led many to declare that democracy is in crisis. And as I'm sure many of you have read, Freedom House did its annual global survey uh, and issued it last month. And like other studies put out by The Economist and the Bertelsmann Foundation, the Freedom House report finds that political rights and civil liberties around the world have deteriorated to the lowest point in more than a decade. Progress in a few key countries and regions um, these organizations have concluded has been more than overshadowed by renewed authoritarianism in Turkey, the rise of illiberal parties in Europe, state collapse as in, um, in, in an authoritarian Venezuela, and the onset of an Arab winter across much of the Middle East. These reports also document how the world's autocracies, especially Russia, are working to undermine democracy while positioning themselves as an alternative model. A few weeks back, we learned incredible details of Russia's interference campaign in the 2016 presidential election. And last month, the Senate Foreign Relations Committee published a comprehensive analysis of Russia's anti-democratic campaign in Europe. It is uh, both undeniable and deeply disturbing that Russia is actively seeking to undermine democratic practices around the world. It also cries out for a forceful and comprehensive response, one that includes not only sanctions against Russia and steps to protect our own institutions and discourse at home, but also a surge in our efforts to support democracy abroad. Uh, we need to remember that those who wish to tear democracy down can only succeed if democracy's opponents are too timid and too divided to stop them. And there's no doubt in my mind that freedom's foes are seeking to divide us and dissuade us from doing more. I don't think we can forget that Russia is run by a KGB agent. And that's why, in part, we continue to hear some argue that the work of NDI uh, and uh, you know, we're trying to show that what is really going on, how different it is. And there are some who argue that the work of NDI and other democracy organizations is no different from Russia's efforts to interfere in other countries. There, there's a diplomatic term of art for that, and its abbreviation is BS. Uh, <clears throat> um, and, and Ken, I, I think this is so worth pointing out, is because Ken, uh, in a New York Times article last week, um, that this is not just comparing apples and oranges, rather, or it, it isn't just apples and oranges, rather it's comparing someone, and I think this is such a very, very good point. It's comparing someone who delivers life-saving medicine to someone who brings deadly poison. The, um, the democracy assistance we deploy is designed to promote integrity, transparency, and accountability. Compare that to what Russia does, which aims to undermine confidence, skew election results, and sow discord. We cannot let this false equivalence stand, and we cannot let propaganda dissuade us from pressing forward with democracy support. I know from my own experience that this can be exhilarating but humbling work, because in any society, building democracy is never easy, never fully accomplished. It's something to be worked toward, step by step, country by country, day by day. But it's worth it because uh, we know we will do better and feel safer in an environment where our values are widely shared, markets are open, military clashes are constrained, and those who run roughshod over the rights of others are confronted. Now make no mistake, American freedom, prosperity, and peace depend in large measure on whether democratic institutions succeed around the world. And that depends, in turn, on America's willingness to continue working with our partners to promote democracy. And that depends on whether the administration and Congress 
provide the resources required for our most effective democracy builders to do their jobs. I have to say, and it's no surprise, I think, to anybody in this room, that I've been deeply disappointed by the steep and arbitrary funding cuts to democracy assistance this administration has proposed in its loony requests for the State Department and International Affairs budget. But I've also been heartened by the response of, from leaders of both parties on the Hill who have rejected those cuts and uh, provided full funding for the State Department and USAID's democracy programs, as well as the National Endowment for Democracy and for the uh, core institutes. That support should continue because we need to be doing more, not less, to tell our story and support democracy and human rights abroad. And above all, we've got to remember that uh, without this commitment, American foreign policy would lose its moral compass, its most compelling claim to global respect, and ultimately, the support and understanding of the American people. Freedom is perhaps the clearest expression of national purpose ever adopted, and it's America's purpose. So, like other profound humani uh, human aspirations, it, it never can be fully achieved. And it's not a possession, it's a pursuit. And few have done more for that pursuit over the last three decades than Ken Wallach and the team that he has led at the National Democratic Institute. It's been my honor to work alongside him, and I look forward very much to the discussion uh, here this morning. And thank you all for being here to honor Ken, who nobody deserves more uh, claim than he for what has been happening. Thank you, Secretary. That was great. Thank you. All right. Okay. Ken, come on up here. Now, you can see it's a full house, and I think that speaks to your service and also the fact that Secretary Albright and you have done such important work, and so I'm uh, really pleased that we're hosting this for you. So, Thank you, thank you, you Dan, for, for this invitation. It's a little intimidating. <laughs> uh, I have to admit, not only having my chairman sitting in the front row, uh, but there are a lot of people who should be up here along with uh, Secretary Albright and myself, uh, people who have dedicated a good deal of their professional life to this mission. Uh, Carl Gershman and Bill Sweeney, um, and John Sullivan. Uh, John Sullivan, who is there, uh, my counterparts from the Solidarity Center and the Center for International Private Enterprise, um, uh, colleagues at USAID and the Department of State. Um, so it's a, it's a real honor, and, and thank you for joining me. I just want to say one, a, a few things, and, and the first is about the Secretary. Um, there is no doubt that she is the um, indispensable leader on these issues, uh, though that's my word, not yours, uh, in this context. Um, it's not only at NDI, um, although, and I always complain that she does not have a monogamous relationship with the Institute. She does a lot of other things. Uh, I complain all the time about it. But like she really, the NED, for example. Yeah, no, it's, it's a, lot of, a lot of organizations, a lot of issues. She, she is a leader. Um, but whether it's on the international stage, whether it's here in the United States, whether it's at NDI, or all the organizations um, that have engaged in this effort, she has been not only a rock, but she has been the voice. Uh, she has been the inspiration yeah. for the efforts that we carry out. And it has been a great privilege, and having her introduce me is, is a great honor. So, Madeline, you've been extraordinary. Um, uh, secondly, the Secretary talked about the growth of NDI, but there was similar growth of, of many of the organizations that, uh, that are represented in this room. And that is because uh, the U.S. government, and particularly um, uh, the National Endowment for Democracy when it began in 1983, but then USAID and the State Department began to provide resources for this. Um, and the partnership that 
we and others have had with the U.S. government. Senator Luger once called this a public-private partnership, is what allowed us to expand and have permanent presence on the ground, and that support has been absolutely critical. Um, this was, in the early days, highly controversial. Um, people don't realize it. Uh, uh, I and Carl and, and others spent hours going through five-hour debates in the Senate and the House on this issue. Um, Republicans loved it and Republicans hated it. Democrats loved it and Democrats hated it. Uh, Jesse Helms was a big opponent. Orrin Hatch was a supporter. Ted Kennedy was a proponent. Uh, Barney Frank was a strong uh, critic. Um, and it went on for a number of years at that time. Um, and there were two seminal events, I think, that changed the debate in Washington. Um, one was the snap elections in the Philippines in 1986 in which Ferdinand Marcos lost uh, an election to Corazon Aquino after the People Power Revolution. And the second, nearly two years later, was the presidential plebiscite in Chile, in which the, the no command, the no forces, denied Pinochet another eight years in power, forcing a democratic open election a year later. And it brought Democrats, Republicans, liberals, and conservatives together. And the reason for this was that there was a realization that this was not somehow cultural imperialism, um, that, but the forces on the far right and the far left really had a symbiotic relationship. And when the democratic center from left to right had an opportunity to express themselves, um, they chose something in the middle. And um, this was happening during the Cold War. And I think conservatives on the Hill saw that there was a alternative to dictatorships. And the left on Capitol Hill realized that, uh, that this was not cultural imperialism, that we were not driven solely by uh, Soviet communism. We were driven by other principles as well. Um, and this brought everybody together. And then the wall came down and became, uh, I think, important priority for, for the United States. So this was a long time ago, but I think those two events were absolutely critical at that time. And, and many people in this room played an important role. And those democratic forces received a lot of international and American support, which they today uh, credit to, uh, uh, to their, their efforts on the ground during that critical time. Ken, could you, could you just take it? How did you end up working at NDI? Did you get a phone call? What, what happened? Um, well, no. Was there an ad in the paper? <laughs> no, no. Um, I was publishing a newsletter on the Middle East and writing for the LA Times. I was sick of writing. Um, I think it's the hardest thing to do is to write a simple declarative sentence, uh, <laughs> particularly an 800-word uh, op-ed piece. Um, I remember one day Newsweek calling up and said, could you write a 1,500-word piece? And I said, oh my god, please, I can start right now. It <laughs> took me about 15 minutes. Uh, but I was really tired of writing. I wanted to get back to something, a, a cause-oriented um, uh, effort. And a very, very good friend of mine, um, Brian Atwood, was the first president of NDI. And um, I sought out his advice. And he said, come here, we need a vice president. And he said, but I have to warn you that you, uh, we and the Republican Institute has been defunded by the Congress. Um, and uh, we've been restored uh, by a one vote margin in the Senate. 46 to 45 vote in the Senate, and that's because a senator from a western state voted the wrong way. He meant to vote against oh, us, no. he voted for us. And the funding was restored, but we didn't know whether that would last. And Brian and I had been a good friend and uh, friends in the past, and, uh, and I think it was Brian's um, leadership at NDI and the secretary's leadership uh, at, at NDI that establish a foundation uh, for the organization. And in that sense, it has been easy for me uh, because people talk about change in organizational development, change and continuity. And sometimes it's easy to make changes. And NDI has changed a lot, but at the same time to protect continuity, to protect values, to protect personalities um, is as important as uh, trying to change with the times. So balancing these two, I think, is a huge challenge. And I think Brian and, 
and the Secretary established that on day one. Ken, talk about the late 80s, early 90s. You talked about the, the two watershed moments in the Philippines and Chile, but it, it seems to me, and Secretary Albright was saying earlier in a, in a pre-game conversation we are having, that um, being in, in this business in 1989 was like being in a candy store. So it, it seems as if there was a period of time where this was easier going. Can you talk a little bit about that and what, what that was like and what, what, were you, what, were the, what, were, what were you doing? What were other, other organizations doing? I need to make a brief infomercial. I'm on the board of IFAS, so I recognize Bill Sweeney. And so I just need to say, and I know in addition to the NET institutions, there's IFAS and other institutions that do this work as well. So. Well, it seemed for those of us who were engaged in the, um, in the Philippines and Chile in those early days, um, I always say we peaked too early. Um, it seemed almost, looking back at it, it seemed inevitable. Um, but those were very heady days in which, you know, forces for good, democratic forces prevailed over forces of evil. And as I said, they, they benefited from the international attention and support. And then came Panama and, and Nicaragua. Um, and again, you had democratic forces that were able to overcome um, dictatorships. Um, and I think that we are all lulled into a sense of, as the Secretary said, euphoria, that somehow that this was a linear process, um, that once you have a democratic transition, uh, progress would be made, uh, institutions would be established, uh, people, citizen-centric policies would be adopted, um, we could pack our bags and, and go home. Um, and, um, and I think it was Branislav Goremek, the former solidarity leader and foreign minister, the late Goremek, who said that democracy doesn't necessarily go from triumph to triumph. And we learned some very important things early on, and that is that Democrats are more democratic in opposition than they are in government, and we learned that lesson well. And secondly is that new democratic regimes often inherit the legacies of their non-democratic predecessors, whether it's poverty, disease, corruption, apathy. Um, and people disliked their dictators, but to some degree they believed in, in the propaganda. So let's not forget that Marcos received uh, nearly half of the vote in the Philippines. And Pinochet, during that pleb plebiscite, uh, received nearly half of the vote in Chile. Um, there, there was a segment of the society that wanted to, to hand over its um, uh, authority to a single leader. It was easier than making decisions themselves. So we learned very quickly that um, that, as the Secretary always said, that democracy has to deliver. I want to talk about that because I think when I think about de delivering on democracy, this is something Secretary Albright has popularized. I think you're also associated with this word as well, this phrase as well. But talk a little bit, what does that mean? What is delivering on democracy? Because I think this is a very important point. Well, it means that, you know, it, it, the London School of Economics did a, a study of 800 protest movements around the world. Mm. And the study showed that what motivated people was not uh, economic issues, but political issues, that people wanted, a, wanted democracy or a better democracy. However, they had certain ec economic expectations uh, from the result of that. Uh, they expected standards of living to improve. They expected more accountable government. They expected more uh, dedicated resources to issues that they care about, and that's jobs and uh, shelter and employment, uh, uh, health care. And um, when governments don't deliver, uh, Joseph Stiglitz once said that people go to the streets. And that's not the way that public policy issues should be resolved. Or they end up voting for a Hugo Chavez. And it was Chavez who once said that I'm not the yes. cause, I am the result. Yes. And he became the result of failed political institutions uh, that were seen as out of touch and corrupt uh, by the people of the country. Um, and so it is literally a race against time. And if I think there is a change not a change of priorities, but a, a, a focus on fragile new democracies. 
um, you know, there is an image of democracy advocates and promoters and supporters that our work is to support good people against bad people, and that's true. However, 50% of the countries where we work in are new democracies and fragile democracies that have made the decision uh, that this is a system that they want for their country. And these are governments, these are political leaders, opposition leaders, civil society. And the question is, how do you sustain those democratic advances and to ensure that these institutions deliver um, so there is not backsliding? And so much of our work is now in the governance field, um, as well as the places that are non-democratic or semi-authoritarian. But the challenges are great. Um, but even with the recent Freedom House report and the Economist report, if you look in 1986 when I came to NDI, Freedom House, I think, had about 50 countries in the free category. Yeah. And, and today, there are 90 countries in that category. Um, so there are success stories. There are countries that have been able to, uh, to manage their political system in a way that citizens are much more engaged. And if there is backsliding, people stand up. You look at recent actions in, in Burkina Faso and in Zambia and, and uh, other places in which citizens stand up. And even in some of the most unlikely places on earth, um, there are democratic subcultures that are developing, even in places like Syria today, which I, I can talk about. So the notion of helping these fragile democracies, um, and unlike the Russians, um, this, these are places where people in and out of government welcome international intention and support and expertise and the sharing of experiences because they have to change their political systems virtually overnight and they can benefit from the lessons that others have gone through uh, that uh, they have learned from their transitions mm -hmm. and learn from the mistakes as well as the successes. So Secretary Albright talked about the difference between re what Russia is doing and what we do as the difference between poison and medicine. Could you talk a little bit more about this because I think there is a growing narrative or pushback about the kinds of work that NDI does or the other groups that are in this room do. Say, and so the Russians will say, well, we, we're, we're, quote unquote, we're doing the same thing. Now, it's cynical as all get out, and it's not true. But that's, there's a narrative out there. So what, talk a little bit more about that, because I think it's very dangerous. Well, I think a lot of this was summarized in that New York Times article last week. Um, in which the headlines talk about meddling, Russian meddling and US meddling in the elections. And I hate the word meddling. Um, but um, there are some fundamental differences uh, between what the Russians do, as the Secretary said, and, and what organizations like we do. Um, first of all, if you look at elections in Russia and elections here and in other democratic countries, they're the same in name only. Um, uh, what happens in Russia are not genuine elections. Oh. And, um, and yet they are committed as a member of the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, OSCE, uh, the OSCE, um, to conduct democratic elections. And there are criteria for doing that. And every election you have uh, the OSCE delegations that go in and castigate the elections in Russia, say that they don't meet international or OSCE standards, election after election. So even to put the term elections in uh, what happens in other places to what happens in Russia is, is, not, uh, is not an equivalent uh, uh, description. Secondly, when organizations, outside organizations, and it's not only the United States and, and organ, American organizations, it's many organizations around the world. What we try to do is encourage participation, accountability, um, confidence in a process, help citizens um, uh, protect the integrity of the process, uh, advocate for reform to make the process fair. Um, and Putin, I think, is quite fearful of what the Russian regime considers to be colored revolutions that have been, um, in his mind, um, uh, spurred by, by the United States. But if you look at all of those so-called colored revolutions, whether it's in Kyrgyzstan or Georgia or Ukraine, Serbia, um, they all had one thing in common, and that is they followed failed elections. And what happened is that citizens rose up to protect their, their ballot. 
Um, and this was not an American, the color revolution wasn't an American invention. It was really an Asian invention. This was the people power revolution in the Philippines. Mm, yellow. In which, in which uh, Marcos had ordered the computer operators in the churches to change the results. And people rose up to protect yeah. the, the, the will of the people. And that was true in all the other color revolutions. So the, the answer to this is have a good election. Um, and uh, so Putin is fearful. So what he did, however, is exactly the opposite. Uh, he operated in secrecy. Um, we operate in transparency. He tried to subvert the system. Um, he tried to skew the system. Um, and so to, to create a moral equivalency over these, these things, are, I think, is a travesty. There are instances, and the New York Times pointed out, that the United States government during the Cold War had acted in a way to interfere in elections overseas. Um, one of the issues that I pointed out, however, to the reporter was that you're looking at examples 60, 70 years ago. And the world has changed since then, and the United States has changed since then. And um, these types of interventions by the United States uh, uh, don't happen. And, uh, and when they debate these issues now in government, and they have in the past in places like Iraq, generally in the end they pull back from these types of interventions that were more common 60 or 70 years ago during the Cold War. And so we've changed, but the, the Russians haven't changed in this regard. Everyone want to just press on this issue of, of other countries that are like the United States that do important work in this area? Because I. I I've done a lot of work with the private sector and with philanthropy and multilateral organizations. I continue to believe that this is something that the United States government, in partnership with a, an ecosystem of partners represented in this room, have to continue to do. And I think there are other countries that have also concluded, concluded right. the same thing. Could you talk a little bit about some of the other countries that are doing important work in this field? I think there are three things that have changed um, from the situation that existed 35 years ago. Um, First of all, the United States has changed in this regard. Um, I remember when NDI first went into Mexico, and I won't name the name of the ambassador, who said, what are you doing in my country? No oh boy. He said, you're not going to bring the people power revolution to, to Mexico. Um, he didn't realize, however, that we were invited into Mexico by the leading reformer in the PRI party, um, uh, Mr. Colosio, who was trying to lead a reform effort within the ruling party, a 70-year-old ruling party in Mexico. Um, uh, tragically, he, he was, was murdered. Um, but, um, uh, but today, there has been a sea change. Every U.S. ambassador has democracy and human rights as part of his or her portfolio. Now, it may not be item number one on the bilateral agenda, um, but it is part of that portfolio, and that's been a huge change. Secondly, um, there is now an international architecture around democracy support that never existed 35 years ago. And that architecture includes non-governmental organizations like ours, many, many of the people in this room represent. Um, there are intergovernmental organizations that are engaged in this. There are other governments that are engaged in this. And interestingly enough, even some of some those in the traditional development community and international financial institutions, although they, they may be more reluctant to use the D word uh, in describing the work, but they talk about social accountability and open political accountable systems, governance. accountable governance, uh, inclusion. Um, they use other words to describe it, but there is a general understanding now that there is a linkage between human development, political development, and economic development in countries. And the most profound report on this was the sort of the landmark uh, human development report by the UNDP in 2002. Is the they, Arab Human Development Report? No, that no. came later but it was the Global Human Development Report where they talked about the, the linkages between human development and democratic politics. Um, and so there is this international architecture that exists, and it's quite, quite extensive. Um, the UNDP describes its budget as half going to uh, democracy and governance programs. Um, and they use that, those terms. And they use those terms. Um, so, the United Nations has a democracy fund. So, so there, there, 
people talk about this issue differently. It's part of the lexicon now of international relations that didn't exist 35 years ago. And finally, what's changed is that demand exists on the ground. That, as the Secretary said, that, that people want economic opportunities uh, and they want a political voice, but they're not willing to sacrifice the latter for the former. Um, they are in a demanding mood. And, um, you know, I look at the, the global situation and you look at the continent of Africa, for example, that between 1960 and 1990, you had four African heads of state who stepped down voluntarily or lost an election, four in those 30 years. And since 1990, um, that figure is about 50 of African leaders who have now stepped down, which represents a changing face on the continent. And you have young people on the continent, the youth bulge, who never knew a military government, never knew a single party regime. And they're not willing to go back uh, to that type of, it's alien to them. And so you, you do have a demand that exists today um, that didn't exist 35 years ago. And it reflects an interdependent world. Can, can, can I, let's just, you just referenced Africa. Could you talk a little bit about Zimbabwe, which is a particularly complicated case, but there's been some tectonic shifts there recently. Are you optimistic <coughs> about Zimbabwe? I'm going there in about three weeks. Um, so I'll be in a better position to yeah. talk about it then. But, you know, it's a big question right now in the, in, whether what happened is a coup or what happened in a transition, and different people are looking at this in different ways. Um, the U.S. is looking at this slightly different than the Europeans, um, and, um, and I think we will know what direction that this government is going based on the upcoming elections that will take place, I think, around July. Um, because what you had is a system that guaranteed ZANU-PF victory in the country, it, it basically uh, creates a, a voter registry in the country that favors uh, rural areas. Uh, the last election, about a million people were disenfranchised because of the voter registry, and they were disenfranchised in the urban areas, which was the, the opposition MDC stronghold. So we'll see whether this government will, will, will be willing to change the rules of the game, um, will be, allow an open process, or will they fear an MDC victory? And, um, and many of the people that are in the government right now were also part of the ZANU-PF efforts to, to rig the previous election. So, so we'll see. They're speaking differently. They've talked about allowing European and American observers to come. They're talking about uh, reforms in, in the election authorities and in the voter mm. registry, but we'll so wait and see right so now. So do I mark you down as an optimistic pessimist? On, the on secretary says she's an optimist who worries a lot. So <laughs> All right. You can put me in that camp. Put you in that camp. All right. So I've got a, I, so there's been a lot of talk in the last 10 plus years about a recession in democracy. So I'm, I remain optimistic. I, I think I'm in the same camp as an optimist who worries a lot. And there's been uh, the bad guys have gotten better being bad. And there's been a sort of a closing discussion about a closing civil society space. So, you know, we talked earlier about 1989 to, I don't know, maybe sort of, there was sort of a 15 year period where there was sort of, I'm guessing, let's put it 1989 to about the early 2000s maybe 2001, 2002, 2003. And then there's been sort of a period since where it's gotten more tricky. Can you talk a little bit about that and tell me something helpful, please, about this? Because this has been, you know, there's, a, there's a, been a lot of pessimism about, about the, the business, if I can put it that way, in the last, in, in the last while because of sort of the, these uh, authoritarians getting better at this, using technologies in ways that, you know, perhaps are disappointing from what we originally hoped that they would achieve? Well, this has been chronicled all over the world. I, I, you know, you have what's called authoritarian learning. Um, I think in reaction to many of the people power revolutions, color revolutions that have taken place uh, around the world where you have regimes that are fearful of losing control. Um, <coughs> And these are in the category of countries that we would describe as semi-authoritarian regimes, where you have democratic forms, you have 
elections, you have an opposition press, you have political parties, even opposition parties, you have some civil society activity, but in reality, one regime, one party, one individual controls the, 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 the political system and, um, and arrogates most, if not all, power to himself, and usually it's a him, uh, or to the regime. Um, and um, they become more adept at uh, maintaining control and fearing even a diffusion of political power for fear of losing control. And so what you have are traditional means that they, they have always used of harassment, intimidation, um, uh, sometimes murder, uh, imprisonment, um, to, uh, to keep civil society organizations and political parties off guard, uh, to weaken them. And then they've used what, what, what we call the rule, the rule by law, not the rule of law, uh, to create legal mechanisms um, that will restrict local organizations and cut their ties these local organizations and groups and individuals to the international community um, in terms of funding, in terms of human contact. And so what they want to do is, is to isolate their political system from the rest of the world. Um, and this is true with political parties, it's true with parliaments, it's true with civil society, it's true with reformers in these countries. Um, and so organizations like ours become, in a way, the canaries in the coal mine. Um, and once we begin um, receiving some of these uh, signals, uh, soon after you find local groups are, are also being, uh, being attacked. Um, and a new phenomenon that's happened is that these countries are sharing information uh, with each other. Um, you know, there, I talked about a democratic ar architecture and a democratic movement that exists around the world made up of governments and civil society and organizations, but now there is a network of authoritarian regimes. And to some degree, Moscow is an epicenter of this, uh, but they all communicate. So a law restricting civil society organizations in one country introduced and passed on Monday is suddenly introduced and passed in another country a month later. Let's just copy paste um, it and bring it here. Yeah, absolutely. Bring this best and, practice and, and they quotes, learn right? from each other. W that, wasn't there somebody, Ken? There was somebody who either worked at either one of one of the organizations here that that sort of took the the good the good person the good guy playbook and brought it to Russia. Wasn't isn't there some Russian operative who either worked at that, that sort of took this and has sort of taken our playbook and flipped it. Is there somebody, isn't there somebody like that? I could have sworn there's, well, I'll have to, I'll, I'll come back to you about that, but I could have sworn I met somebody who had, who had. I uh, think Putin is the expert on this. I, I what, think he, I think. What do we do about this? I mean, this is, what you've just described is terrible. And how do we, how do we push back against this? We absolutely, your organization, organizations like yours are the canary in the coal mine. How do, what are the tactics, what are the ways in which, how do we push back against Because this is, they have gotten better and better and better at this. Yeah, the most recent example of this was Hun Sen in Cambodia. And when I, when I said to the ambassador, we're the canary in the coal mine, he said, or you're the coal mine. Um, <laughs> but there was a, a decision, I think, by, by the prime minister and his middle son um, that their internal polls showed that they were going to lose uh, the elections this year. And so therefore, in literally in a matter of a week, uh, kicked out all the foreign organizations, shut down the opposition, began to shut down the opposition press uh, to guarantee an electoral outcome um, uh, later this year. Um, look, I, I think there are a number of things that, that need to be done in this regard. The first is to understand democratic subcultures in these places. I remember in Russia many, many years ago, the then deputy mayor of Moscow, Mr. Stankevich, um, I asked him about the work of our organizations and working in this field. This is a big country with 11 time zones. Um, and he said, what you have to understand is we're in a pre-pre-transition period in this country. Mm. And this is gonna take a long time here. But what you and others are trying to do is to create these democratic subcultures. And I don't know when a breakthrough is going to happen 
you are not going to create the breakthrough. But don't allow these groups and individuals to atrophy. And this has been a philosophy of the National Endowment for Democracy for years, is how sometimes in certain situations, how do you keep groups and organizations and individuals alive, sometimes literally, um, but figuratively, so they're able to fill a political vacuum once a breakthrough uh, uh, took place. I think, uh, as Stanley, I think, would agree, this happened in Indonesia uh, under Suharto. A lot of organizations were were supported during that period. It was true in South Africa. And a lot of people were able to fill that political vacuum when, when he departed the scene. So part of it is lowering expectations. Nobody is going to create uh, the democratic revolutions in these places. But we can support people who are, who are sacrificing a great deal. There is a, a Russian dissident. Um, many of you in this room know him very well. And he talks, tells the story of a very famous uh, a pianist in the Soviet Union in the late 40s, Rudolf Kerr, who um, was exiled to Kazakhstan by, to Kazakhstan by, by Stalin. And for 13 years, he was without his piano. Ugh. And so what he did is he took a plank of wood, and for 13 years, he practiced on the plank of wood. And um, Kor uh, Khrushchev allowed him to return to Moscow. 13 years later, and he became the most famous pianist in, in the Soviet Union. Um, and this dissident said, we're playing on our political plank right now. And wow. he said, this is, this is what we're doing, and eventually we'll be, be, be playing on our piano. Okay. And so in a way, the international support that these people receive in these situations become quite critical. And the international solidarity that they receive. Yeah. Now, Aung San Suu Kyi talked about this when, when she was under house arrest. Havel talked about this when he was in prison. That just knowing that the international community is there, yeah. support is provided, attention is given. Um, these are the minimum things we can do. And then I would say this international architecture that exists, we have to bolster the, this international architecture. There was a time that the OAS had a non-intervention clause uh, in, yeah, its, yeah. in its charter. Um, and then there was a speech after the Panamanian elections by uh, the then president of Venezuela, Carlos Andros Perez, who said non-intervention is a form of intervention on behalf of non-democratic forces. Wow. They abandoned the, the non-intervention clause. Uh, they adopted the Santiago Resolution. 1080 came later, and then the Democratic Charter, which unfortunately weakened 1080, which I think there are many in the OAS would like to go back to. Africa then uh, adopted a democratic charter uh, modeled after the OAS and has used that democratic charter uh, to intervene in a number of places, most recently in the Gambia, uh, to, to uphold the integrity of the elections. You referenced Venezuela. Could you just spend a minute on Venezuela? And I think you talked about it earlier. I do think that Hugo Chavez is absolutely a result of not delivering on democracy and the failure of Venezuelan democracy. Talk a little bit about how does this end? I just had a meeting on this with a hemispheric leader who said, I don't know how this is going to end. This is, he, he did not see a, a good way that this process was going to end unless that there was a, an inserted effort in the hemisphere, um, uh, stronger, much stronger efforts by the United States, the Europeans, and others um, to, to isolate the country and to apply even stronger sanctions against the country. Because the regime right now is committed to go down with the ship. Um, uh, but in a way, the, the, the ship has to go down in order to, in his, in his view, in order for, for ultimately the situation to change. Um, you do have efforts on the part of the opposition, but like in so many dictatorships, there was a brilliant New York Times article written in the 80s that talked about fragmented oppositions. And in a way, don't blame the oppositions, blame the regimes because to some degree they become the mere image of, of the regimes in these countries. Um, and there are many differences within the opposition of how to, how to respond okay. to, to the situation. But I don't, 
right now, I don't see any quick solution to this problem. Let me just to cover a couple other countries, and I want to open it up, but uh, Iran. So there's been, um, I don't know, three, three moments, at least three moments in the last 20 years where there's been sort of a, mo a popular percolation or whatever, however you want to describe it. Uh, what, talk a little bit about Iran and what, uh, put aside sort of the, the confrontation we have on the security side, what, what, what happens, what's happening there? Um, I, what's interesting about this, um, this latest movement is it didn't come from the capital, it came from the provinces. And I think in more and more places, um, citizens are saying that their governments are not, are not delivering and, and many of the non-urban areas are affected mm -hmm. most profoundly about this. But in Iran, and I think in places like Syria, there are these democratic subcultures, there are these pockets. And I think as the situation continues in this country, the economic situation mm -hmm. continues to deteriorate, we're going to see more of what we, what we saw uh, last year. Um, I don't know where it leads, uh, but there are these pockets mm -hmm. of resistance that exist, and I think that will only grow. And the idea that it came outside the capital is a telling sign of growing discontent with the, with the regime. So, uh, let's talk about the Arab world. There was the Arab Spring uh, 2011. Um, you could argue, talk a little bit about what's happened since then, and could you spend specifically just a minute on Tunisia? Um, well, uh, you know, it's, it's, I think everyone was extremely um, disappointed of what took place, underestimated the deep state in many of these countries. The real deep state. The real deep state. Um, and, um, but this is only a chapter in a larger book. Um, if you look at the countries that are doing best on issues of economic growth, on issues of terrorism, extremism, um, if you, these are the countries that are the quote unquote liberalizers or reformers. Um, if you look at Morocco, if you look at Jordan, if you look at uh, Tunisia, even Algeria and Lebanon, and uh, these are countries that are managing the system much better than the Egypts or Syrias or Yemens. And political space in these countries are expanding. Um, the governments there are recognizing that they have to, um, uh, that they have to compromise on issues. Um, and people ought to learn from this of how to respond to uh, the citizen demands in these places. Uh, Carl, in a speech that he gave uh, not too long ago, uh, referred to the Polish uh, philosopher Leszek uh, Kolakowski, who um, talked about, he was talking about the situation in Hungary in 56 and uh, solidarity in, in 1981 in which it seemed like the democratic forces in these places were crushed or failed. And yet, the regimes were dis discredited um, under these situations. They had to compromise. And the democratic struggle that took place by civic movements and political movements um, could regroup on a higher plateau. And I think that that's what's happened to some degree in the Middle East. You're going to see a resurgence of, of these democratic demands uh, that existed during, during the Arab Spring in many of these places. Um, in Syria, we are working in 25 communities in liberated areas in northern Syria, uh, bringing citizen groups together, helping them identify, uh, identify um, priorities in their community bringing them together with local administrative councils that are delivering on priorities that are identified by citizens. And what's interesting is that this is not lecturing on democracy, it's, 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 but it's, it's identifying a need that they have. And in these circumstances, when there is not conflict, the extremist groups like al-Nusra try to set up parallel systems. And these citizen groups and these local administration, administrative councils push them out of the territory um, because that they've been empowered by a process that mm -hmm. they've established themselves, but with outside support uh, and, and the use of sort of convening power to bring them together. So in all of these areas that there are pockets 
uh, uh, democratic subculture pockets that I think will continue. And then I think they can learn a lot from the countries that are the liberalizers and the, um, and the, um, and the reformers. I want you to talk, just comment a little bit about China. So are we gonna, am I going to live to see a, d a democracy in China? I, I think the, ac the action by <laughs> President Xi may hasten change, not, not, uh, not the opposite. Um, really? But, you know, I, I think to some degree, uh, I'm not a China expert, um, to some degree the, the current economic success in China masks um, the, the forced um, uh, efforts of the, uh, of the previous regimes in China. Uh, the forced marches and the cultural revolution oh um, where millions of people die. Millions. And the problem with authoritarian regimes is when they make mistakes, uh, there's nobody there to correct uh, the huge re results, the massive uh, re uh, negative results of those mistakes. And I think that's going to happen with regard to corruption in China. You know, there are thousands of protests that take place every year that we don't hear about. Um, so, you know, the question is whether we, we look at snapshots or we look at longer trends. And I think, you know, when we look over the past 35 years or longer, I think it's more important to look at these longer trends and then prepare for, for these changes on a longer horizon than we do. Unfortunately, Americans feel that we have to have quarterly, quarterly dividends. Um, and I think we have to look at these issues in a uh, much longer horizon. So just two more points and then I'm gonna, I'll, I'll open it up. So technology, you opened up an office in Silicon Valley, why did you do that? Well, there's, there's two things. Um, and the secretary um, uses this quote all the time too and we've all stolen it from either an Obama campaign person or a Mexican techie um, who said that citizens are communicating using uh, 21st century technology. Uh, political institutions and governments are listening using 20th century technology and responding using 19th century technology. And, and as I mentioned earlier, these political institutions are, have become fearful of this technology. It's very difficult for them to separate the noise from the signal. Um, and they tend to retreat. And for those of us who are supporting some of these institutions and trying to bring citizens into government and into policy making, um, whether they're parties and parliaments and governments, is how do you get government and um, uh, to help use technology to communicate with citizens and how do you use technology to solve problems. Many of these things are happening in municipalities. Um, and all around, even in mega cities around the world. And there are groups uh, patterned after Code for America um, mm. that you may have heard at. There's now codes uh, f for all, all around the world. We're serving as a secretariat for those organizations right now that are trying to use technology to help government deliver on, on, on certain services. Um, so there are companies in Silicon Valley uh, that can use technology, uh, and we're helping us use technology in, the, in this space. Not only on, on, on the side of civil society, but also with government uh, to help solve the communities. These are big uh, tech companies, but they're also startup companies too. And that they, that they can also help in other areas too. In Zimbabwe, you mentioned earlier, um, there was our local partner that was doing a parallel vote tabulation from the official count, which exposed many of the, many of the problems in the elections. Um, and they were fearful that, um, that the government was going to cut off the communication system that was designed through an SMS. Um, and um, so there was a startup firm in Silicon Valley designed a system so the local observers around the country could communicate um, via SMS to lines outside the country and then have it returned to a central location so nobody could cut it off inside, inside Zimbabwe. So that there are technological solutions to problems that companies in Silicon Valley can help with. And now the disinformation uh, 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 issue 
has become a huge issue in Silicon Valley. And what we're trying to do is to build a coalition of organizations around the world that can serve as an interlocutor with these tech companies to what we call design for democracy mm. in their work. Um, because it is happening on the ground in every single day. And you need eyes and ears and relationships with the tech com companies to help them understand how severe this problem is. Uh, as an example of this in Serbia, before the local elections, the Democratic Party of Serbia, its youth Facebook page was taken down because hackers from Russia had infected it with all sorts of horrible things. They, in turn, contacted uh, Facebook. Facebook looked at the site, pulled the site down, um, and the party tried to get it back up after cleaning up um, the material from the hackers, and Facebook didn't respond. We were able, because we were in Silicon Valley, and our relationships get Facebook to put the the, to fix the, it. The, the fix it before the elections took place. But this happens every day in, in dozens and dozens of countries. America. And it is only going to expand. So what you need is a whole coalition of groups operating internationally that can identify, can expose, can detect, and, and counter this. And they need international partners to be able to convey this information to the, to the tech community. So, so Ken, I'm gonna, have, I'm gonna ask you to come up and answer this question at the very end, but I want you to answer the question, what, what makes you hopeful or optimistic about the, about the sector? But I wanna open it now to the, to the audience. So I wanna call on this gentleman here, Steve Mosley, and this woman here, the, for these three. Stanley Roth. Aren't you retiring? Aren't you retiring too? Okay. Now, I, I'm sorry. I have to say, Ken, you are not retiring. I wanted to say we <laughs> we need more Ken Wallach, not less Ken Wallach in Washington. And so I'm hoping we're going to see a lot more of you. And I hope you'll be active in a variety of four, including CSIS. So don't I don't like that. That's this is a retirement free zone. We're not using that term. But yes, go ahead. Um, Stanley Roth, former employee of Secretary Albright. Um, I was struck by your comments about maybe democracy peaking too early in the 80s and thinking, you know, not only did you have the ROK in Chile, um, not only Philippines and Chile, but you had ROK and Taiwan, then you had the disastrous setbacks with Tiananmen and Burma, but then you had the whole wave of what happened afterwards. You've already mentioned staggering changes with the fall of the Soviet Union, but I would add with the secretary as a key player, Indonesia and the birthing of East Timor and backwards. So now skipping to the present and the question is, if you had to pick priorities, and what I mean by that is I completely accept keeping things warm, developing institutions, civil society, for when the politics are right, you know, things that have done because you can't predict when dictatorships will fall. But if you had to pick priorities, not just for the NGO sector, but for the public-private partnership, if we can get the administration to move, you know, what would you pick? For example, I'm thinking South Africa now, maybe an opportunity. Yeah. A little more pushing the envelope, Saudi Arabia. Yeah, what's, the low, what's the low hanging fruit? If we could well, get they're not so low, but um, South Africa is formidable. Saudi Arabia has some remarkable progress on the cultural side, a little trickier on the political side. Is it Tunisia? But in places where you might, is it preventing further slippage, Myanmar yeah. or Eastern okay. Europe? Where would you pick the political priorities? You know, while you're doing all the basic underlying work. If you're going to put your people, time, and money somewhere, where would you, where would you put it, right? Yeah, in addition to the long-term okay. prospects, because I fully buy into that. All right, great. Steve, and then there's someone, and this woman over here. Thanks. Congratulations, Ken. Um, I retired eight years ago, and now I'm working full-time as a volunteer for the United Nations well-being. So uh, don't retire. Absolutely. That's, that's wonderful. Um, one of the things, th 30 years ago, um, and over the past 30 years, the experience in investing in women's development and their freedom and opportunity and, and breaking down the barriers yeah. has helped tremendously on some aspects of alleviating poverty, on improving health, on family um, development. But it hasn't translated to leadership in countries um, as I think we all expected that was the ultimate outcome, that there'd be tremendous opportunities for women to lead countries and make a tremendous difference in peace building and in terms of bringing more democracy. Could you comment about that? What, what are the barriers that are inhibiting that? And what is NDI and your thinking to do to um, bootstrap that up now, building on the enormous um, um, capacity of educated women in the world? Okay. And then let's get this woman, uh, give, give her the microphone. 
to write these down. So this woman, my name is Shauna bader I'm the director of the Solidarity Center. And uh, first I wanted to say uh, to Ken how um, people keep saying don't retire, but as someone who comes from the labor movement, I would say enjoy your retirement. Millions of people <laughs> fought like hell so you could retire yeah, and enjoy it. But our pensions are never as good right. as the labor yeah. <laughs> But um, <laughs> in any event, I wanted to uh, bring something else into the room, which is, you know, when you think about your career, we've heard um, your remarkable knowledge and your great leadership in our field. But I, I want to bring something else into the room, which is your kindness and Amen. your uh, specialness as a leader um, in how you interact with other people. And I just want to say that when I started in this position in October of 2011, you were the first person who invited me out to lunch. You treated me with enormous respect and kindness. Every time I ever needed advice or help or suggestions, I always knew I could call you and you, you never went more than an hour or two without calling me back. Mm. And I just want to thank you for that and say that that's another remarkable as aspect of your leadership. Can, that's one of the reasons I, I want, I yes. <laughs> yes. But, uh, enough with that, yeah. but, it, but there, did I pay for the lunch or did you? Yeah. <laughs> did, it's, your turn now. The, it's your turn now. But, <laughs> but, you said, but you said something I think is really important. And I've said this to our friends at AID and to other donor aid agencies. We all spend a lot of time talking about um, organizational principles and how we label programs and how we design programs. Um, how we describe what we do, you know, what are the organizing principles. And that's all important, and, and it's important to do that. But ultimately, we, and I, this entire community, is successful based on relationships that exist on the ground. Nobody spends a lot of time talking about those relationships. You can have the best program, the best design program, um, it's described in the best way, but if you have the wrong people and the wrong relationships, you're going to fail. And how do you establish those relationships? How do you forge those, rela forge those relationships on the ground? How do those relationships change over time? And how do you understand how they're changed? Who should be the, inter the initial interlocutor? Um, what is direct support and indirect support? How do you relate to people? These are the most important things. And you know, I remember a member of our board asked, when you send somebody overseas to do this work, what is the most important characteristic? And I said that that person's normal. <laughs> and, and it's true, because any personality quirk that somebody will have here or in Europe or who will be going to another country in a difficult environment, that personality quirk is not going to show many signs in a more an open process. But when you go to a difficult environment in a foreign country, that'll become the predominant personality quirk. And so, how do how do you, what type of people go? What type of relationships are established with local partners? And that deserves a lot more studying uh, by all of us all the time. Um, and but it's key to success or to failure. Um, in these places. Can, 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 um, I, can I just interject just for a second and just say re regarding the Solidarity Center, I, I'm so pleased you, you, you spoke up. I, I, I just think, could you just spend a minute on uh, Lane Kirkland and what role he played in sort of the, because I think that, I, is, that is an unsung. I, there, and I've told Shauna this and I re did this in a speech I made to Georgetown recently. I, I, people describe you know, ask what you do, and I can make the case why this serves U.S. national interests, although I didn't come to this job because it served U.S. national interests. If I was concerned about that, I'd probably go into another profession. Although I do believe this does serve our national security interests. And if you look at the recent documents that have come out from the White House, the, uh, the Defense Department, and the intelligence community, all these documents, whether it's the worldwide threat assessment, whether it's the national security strategy, the defense security strategy, they all have one thing in common, that threats to the United States are the result of failed political institutions and countries. And that you have the, the, the Russia and China that are trying to propagate its authoritarian model or weaken democratic governance in these places and establish countries that do not join alliances based on shared values. So 
those types of things, I think, are, are happening. And, and, and I think those documents have become very, very important. Um, just, would you just remind people who was Lane Kirkland and why is well, it important? Well, I'm sorry, I got off. But l I was at a dinner at Brookings Institution that Strobe Talbot was hosting 20, some 20 years ago. Um, and it was about economic and political development and which comes first and how do you invest in development in countries. And the academics were sitting around saying economic development has to come first and um, you have to have a rising middle class and uh, the development of liberal institutions. And then at that point, you can have uh, a more open political system and, and democracy. Well, after 45 minutes of this, Lane Kirkland <laughs> had enough. And he leaned forward and he spoke very softly, but very powerfully. And in his South Carolina drawl, um, he said that the Hungarians who stood in front of the tanks in 1956 didn't do so, so General Electric could open up a light bulb factory in yeah. Budapest. He said they did it because um, they were defending their freedom and their rights. And we support them because it's the right thing to do. And I think there's never been a better explanation for, I think, what many people in this room have spent a good deal of their life doing, because it's a belief that it's the right thing to do. Um, Anyways, to get Sorry. back to Stanley, I never know how to answer with Stanley. I, it, it, first of all, for organizations like ours, we can prioritize in that way. To some degree, other people do prioritize. Um, many of our funders do this, USAID, the State Department. Uh, the NED is probably the organization where we can gather and, and prioritize ourselves. Hopefully in these situations, because the partnership, I think, is a good partnership with with USAID and the State Department. Um, we can talk about these situations and plan together. Hopefully, we're not necessarily in the driver's seat, uh, but we're in the front seat on the passenger side. Um, but there's another difficulty in prioritizing, too, and that is where you're going to be the most successful, where the needs are the greatest at a particular moment, where you can have the greatest impact. And it's not necessarily the big, strategically important countries. South Africa transition probably never would have taken place in the way it did without Namibia. Uh, what happens in Niger affects Nigeria. What happens in Cote d'Ivoire affects the entire region. So sometimes small places can impact large places, and you can have a greater impact in these small places. So I happen to believe that we have taken more of a non-religious missionary approach to this if there is enough political ferment in these countries, if there are demands for this type of assistance, if there are demands on the ground, you go there. They're the ones that determine the priorities. We don't determine the priorities. And, um, and then the impact of that. And we're, you know, I hate democracy promotion because we do very little promoting mm. and we do a lot of reacting. Um, and it is a little bit um, arrogant for this notion of describing this as sort of an export model, uh, because an export product, because it really isn't. Um, we talk, other, Steve was talking about uh, women and democracy. Oh, yeah, I, you know, I think you know, there are lots of studies written about this, but there is no doubt that the more women that are in elected office and a threshold is passed, in which political institutions and governments focus on issues that citizens care most about. More women that are in elected positions, citizens have a greater confidence in those institutions than they do institutions that are dominated by men. Um, so there is no doubt about this. But policy has to change. And the only way you're going to get policy cha to change that impacts women economically, socially, and politically, is to get more women elected. Um, and the only way you're going to get more women elected is to be higher up on party lists. Um, and the only way they're going to get higher up on party lists and parliamentary systems is the parties have to change and reform and modernize. Um, and that is a huge effort on our part, a major um, Technology is having a major negative impact, however, and that's primarily because of violence against women in politics. Mm. 
And it's not just physical violence against women, it's psychological violence against women. And if you talk to any female politician, and I don't care it's in the developing world or the developed world, every woman politician will talk to you about cyberbullying. And it not only affects them personally and their family, but it affects other women as well who look at this and say, why should I put myself and my family through this? And so this is another huge challenge that technology is presenting and what impact it has on women. Um, entering the field of politics, staying in the field on politics, and trying to assume leadership positions in government. So can, let me and we have a global campaign right now called Not the Cost that deals with violence against women in politics because nobody has recorded this, nobody has documented yeah, this, true. and the UN doesn't do it, and we're now in a process of gathering a lot of this data so we can give it to the UN and they can put it on their agenda in terms of violence against women generally. So Ken, we're coming to the end of our time. Come back to what makes you hopeful? What makes you hopeful? What are you hopeful about? Leave us on a hopeful note. Um, well, I, you know, you know, I, I'm hopeful. Be, I'm hopeful be, for a couple of things. Number one, I look back at this this more broad span of history, which is only 35 years. It's not it's not a century old uh, proposition. And I look at what's taken place over the last over the last 35 years. Um, and um, number one, number two. It's the people we, many in this room, we all work with on the ground. Um, these are people that are sacrificing their livelihood and their lives uh, for these issues. And there are politicians and government officials that are committed to these issues as well. There is, there is a critical mass in many countries around the world um, that want to make the world a better place. Um, and they believe that more open political systems and, and citizen-centric government and, um, is, is part of that, um, is integral to, to a more peaceful and stable world. And to partner with people on the ground um, and to understand what drives them is what gives, gives you hope. Um, and um, and, I, and I, you know, we're not, we're not the end of history, people. Neither is Frank Fukuyama anymore. Um, but, we, but we do believe that over time uh, that people will demand these things and governments are going to have to respond. And the international community has to do the right thing and support, support that cause. Please join me in thanking Ken Wallach.